Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning for those of you that are joining us from the West Coast. We're so happy to have you here today. My name is Shannon Gregg from Cloud Adoption Solutions. So pleased to be joined today from Annalisa Preissner, who's going to give us a wonderful talk on some of the ways that you can use Salesforce for automation. This will really inspire you. When she was sharing her ideas with me for this webinar, I thought, wow, people are going to be really excited about this because there are some really cool things that you can do with automation that is going to be so helpful for you in your Salesforce organization, whether you're in finance, marketing, sales, or anything that's ancillary to one of those positions, you're going to be so excited to be inspired by some of the things that Annalisa has orchestrated to share with you today. Before we get started, I do want to tell you our call for speakers for Life Sciences Dreaming is open. Let me show you exactly where you can find that. If you go on lifesciencesdreaming.com, you'll see there's a little button right here. You can click call for speakers. We are taking speakers for all sorts of our events. We've got Lunch and Learns coming up in the city of Philadelphia. That will actually be in King of Prussia. We've got one in Boston. We've got one in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Those will all be Lunch and Learns panel sessions. And then we've got a two-day amazing event that will be coming up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, August 24th and 25th. This is a Dreamin event. We are so pleased to be sponsored by some wonderful organizations, Salesforce, Capstorm, Elements Cloud, Cloud Adoption Solutions, Steady State Media, Fido SEO. So if you're interested in being a speaker, a sponsor, or an attendee for any of these events, please do let us know. We are super excited about the reception we are already getting for these events. They're going to be marvelous. So please check that out. I will tell you at the end um, how you can get more information on that, but I do not want to delay you any further because I can see we've got friends rolling in. Everyone's on time. I love that. Annalisa, welcome to the stage and thank you so much for being willing to share your experience and expertise with us today. Automation is so key for 2023. We've got a changing economy. We've got a really interesting amount of people who are available in the workforce. Everything seems to be changing. And one of the things that I think is the answer to a lot of our challenges in the workforce today is automation. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen and um, thank you for that excellent lead in. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about, and, and Shannon is bringing up automation a lot. This, this is really like lower touch automation for maybe like a higher or more complex kind of problem. So what we're going to talk about today is not going to be anything intimidating or difficult, um, but something to hopefully, you know, that resonates with you, or you may have experienced similar problems before that you can apply creative solutions to that automation will assist with. So first I'm going to talk about why you're talking with me today. So this is kind of my life sciences journey. I started out in 2011 in a really small ePro company back when it used to be called ePro and everyone did everything. So I got a lot of exposure uh, to a lot of different aspects of the business. Although my primary responsibility was managing and writing proposals, I did get firsthand experience with backend Salesforce because it didn't take much to be an admin there, right? So <laughs> they needed assistance. They were looking for anybody who was willing to help. Um, so really simple requests, like at updating page layouts and adding fields is what I learned how to do there. But it was my first exposure to Salesforce and my first experience with backend Salesforce. I got a lot of experience with Excel in that role, which helped me develop some transferable skills that I use today in Salesforce, like solutioning, requirements gathering, and testing logic, uh, simply because Nobody really wanted to manage or own or be responsible for the pricing model there, that which, which was an Excel-based. So I decided it was, it was something that I should learn. It was a gap that I saw that needed filling. Um, and I ran with it. That company was acquired and continued to manage a team of proposals writers and eventually move into a pricing manager role in 2015. And... Um, after that, I briefly took a, a year out of clinical trials and life sciences to work in healthcare IT. And in the next slide, we'll take a look at um, 
the reasons that I, I took the first opportunity that I could to get back into clinical trials. Um, but I found that it was really more suited for um, what I wanted to do. And I was much more energized by the teams and the groups and the people. So in uh, 2017, I moved to a new company. And in 2019, that company, which was about medium-sized, was also acquired. At that time, they needed somebody to manage Salesforce. There weren't really adequate candidates that were working directly with or responsible for Salesforce on either side of the business. And I was fortunate enough that a couple of people um, volunteered my name. So they felt um, they felt strong enough to uh, put their name on the line, right? To push me forward and volunteered my name. And I was asked to take over managing the sales technology and specifically Salesforce at this much larger company now. More specifically, uh, I led the project to merge the two instances of Salesforce. And that is where I absolutely was immersed in um, Salesforce setup and the basics to the automation. And I was able to really develop the backend system knowledge. So even though I didn't know really enough, I would say, for the job, uh, I knew more than everybody else that was at the company. So, so I ran with it. Uh, finally, after you know capitalizing on all the exposure and experience that I got during that process in 2020, I became officially a Salesforce admin. And now my team has grown a little bit to... Um, manage Salesforce plus uh, about 15 or more applications and packages that plug into Salesforce, as well as sales operations, project management, and training and onboarding for the sales organization. So this is my sales perspective in clinical trials based on the different roles that I've had. And um, in my experience, there are a lot of benefits to selling in this space. I'm aware that there are a lot of hurdles as well. And some of these things can go either way. Like having smart and creative buyers may mean that you're developing systems um, that you're selling or that you're developing the build of systems as you're selling them um, because people are reinventing how they want things to function. But for the most part, um, having a firm and compelling event like first patient, first visit, and having really meaningful checkpoints along the way because of the regulated environment that are driven by the client really help you to tell if a deal is going to move forward. And, you know, based on the experience that I had in other industries for the short periods of time, that, that wasn't available to them. And I can assure you it's not available to my vendors when they're working with me. Um, it's fairly transparent in a lot of ways in this industry, in clinical trials, if that deal is going to progress, if it's on the right path, or if it's shaky, if there's uncertainty. So I think it helps the sales process a lot, and it helps the individuals that are working within the process to uh, be able to forecast and understand their buying signals a little bit better. So we're going to talk about a problem in early stage pipeline management. And it's a little bit funny that we we're talking about early stage development today because my contribution to um, being a Salesforce admin in this space that's unique is that I sat in the roles that managed from, you know, quote request, RFP request and beyond. So I lived and I worked them and I have a lot of firsthand knowledge of how the process works within those later stages. I don't have unique experience of early stage pipeline and progression, but um, in this case, we're gonna look at things that I've seen previously that I think can be improved upon with some flow and some automation to be able to help forecast better for early stage pipeline. So things that are before you have that formal RFP come and um, manage movement within those early stages, particularly measuring meaningful activity. 
activity itself in Salesforce can be very hard to measure at like a molecular scale, like on an opportunity basis. We find that a lot of people that um, are not as good as logging activity, it's because they actually have higher volume. The activity is occurring. They just aren't taking the time to stop and pause and make sure that it's apparent in Salesforce, especially if they have a higher volume of opportunities and accounts that they're managing. So it's not always the best indication. And then understanding if any of that activity was really meaningful, produced the, kind, the right kind of results and gave you the right kind of signals can be difficult as well. So in this case, we're starting with what I've seen in the past, which is two sales, early funnel sales stages, prospecting and qualifying. A little bit ambiguous when you get into the qualifying stage and uh, a lot of opportunities sitting in qualifying for quite a long time. And you don't know the caliber of those opportunities if they're at the very beginning stages. So you've just got someone to agree to engage with you, but you don't know if that, there's no um, no way to measure if that engagement is really hot or, or, or kind of cold. And um, understanding how qualified it is, if it's in very beginning stages or if it's progressed down the line. So in order to change that, with automation, here's an example of what you could do with some gated stage progressions. So in this case, this represents a flow that automatically pushes individuals and opportunities into certain sales stages based on achievement of buying indicators. Here we've added one additional stage, but we've tied to two of these stages, the basic indicators and the key indicators, actions, um, actions internally and actions that occur or are driven by the client to um, ensure that you understand those buying signals. So if I'm moving from assessment to quote request, here we have free entry into assessment, which is really very similar to our previous prospecting stage. Um, you know, we're just confirming that if we're doing our research and we're finding information online or through third-party sources, that this is a real life study. It actually exists. It's going forward in the time frame that we understand and in a time frame that's meaningful for us. And working on gaining entry, so understanding or connecting with somebody at that account that will engage with us. The next two stages, the um, reps are basically either excluded from entering those stages or auto inserted into those stages based on achievement of those indicators. So here I have some examples for our basic indicators that show good indications that that trial is going to move forward. So the client confirms there's a protocol in development. Of course, we have someone, anyone at the account that is engaging with us, doesn't really matter their level, or what kind of persona they are, but that engagement is, that connection is made. In this case, we've added one for an internal clinical assessment. So maybe we have some experts, some scientists within our group or a team that reviews and, and um, analyzes study information to determine the likelihood of that study progressing and the client has communicated a budget. In this case, if our sales reps can check off at least three of these four buying indicators, then that opportunity will automatically progress into our basic indicators stage. And it'll give us a good idea or a good understanding that we really truly have qualified this opportunity. It's in a space that we want, we're getting a connection with somebody at the account, and they're giving us some indications of progression towards RFP. The second stages are key indicators. So these ones are maybe a little bit more difficult to reach, but they're giving us really great indications that we would be inclu included in the quote request or the RFP process, and that that process is pending and upcoming. So in here, we're talking about the client is sharing the protocol or protocol draft with us. They're confirming that their funding has been approved 
They know the timeline of when they're going to start reaching out to, um, to vendors to collect quotes for their RFP process. And they've maybe introduced you with the decision maker, or they've agreed to meet with some of our um, specialists on our side, consultants, clinical leads, um, individuals that have expertise to be able to consult uh, on their protocol. In this case, if the rep can achieve two of these four indicators, that flow will auto progress them into the key indicators. These are really great buying signals now that we're capturing that are very tangible and finite um, that lead us to believe that we probably are in a good spot to push towards being included in that RFP process. And then eventually when that happens, we have free entry into the quote request stage as well. And some of the reasons that we look at these, um, breaking out these early stages a little bit better to help with our forecasting is because in a lot of systems, later stages from the time that you actually create, draft, or requested to create a proposal, they're very tangible. You really understand what's occurred. It's a specific action. Something's been delivered. You've gotten a specific response from a client that are moving those stages in progression while early stages don't have those really finite buying indicators. So this is a way to be able to capture that and increase your insight into how you're progressing before you've received your quote request. So what's the actual intent here, right? The actual intent is to be able to forecast better in your early funnel so that you can see what in your funnel is gonna turn into pipeline. What we're looking at here is movement and time frame. So really specifically, how many of those studies progress through each of those stages and how does that percentage change as we move from the, you know, early the the easiest achievement to the highest achievement stage. What are the number of indicators achieved because we're managing this through let's say just a tick box that it's been achieved on the opportunity. We can say is there a better um, possibility that something's going to move from basic indicators to key indicators when these particular indications um, are met or these buying signals are received? Or do we see a drop off when we um, don't ever get that clinical review that's an internal indicator? And then the time frame, how long does it take things to progress? So when does the progression stop? Do we reach a certain point where things sit in assessment or basic indicators? And if they've been there for X amount of time, we rarely see them progress any further than that. So we can measure um, on our forecast, timeline-based forecast to see what we think is gonna turn into pipeline, later stage pipeline. Then segmenting that measurement, maybe by market segment, by the channel that we're going through. So how does this movement compare if we're going through a CRO versus bidding direct to client, as well as which products are involved in the sale? And the last piece of this automation, which is one of the problems that um, we see a lot that you look to solve with these really early stage opportunities is ensuring that that funnel stays accurate and relevant. So this is another flow that you can implement to auto age out those deals, basically push the deals out of your system that sit there untouched and unactioned and really don't get cleaned up until you do maybe um, your fiscal year account updates and those opportunities get moved to a new rep and they evaluate their pipeline. So some of our reps are, are not as good as others as keeping that information current especially when it's a very early stage, they know less, maybe less individuals or there's less scrutiny on the quality of deals that you have in there. This flow is a time-based triggered flow. So maybe once a month, the first of the month or the fifth of the month, take a look at all of the deals that are still sitting in the very first assessment stage. And based on the trigger criteria, so maybe they were created, 
more than a year ago, the stage is still sitting in assessment. The booking states in the past, no activity logged recently, and the next step follow-up date is passed. If any deals um, hit all of those criteria, then the flow auto closes them with the closed type age out, which is a controlled closed type. So we know that this one was closed as part of the automation. The reps get emailed immediately that that's been done on their behalf. So if the system, you know, happens to be wrong, or if maybe they were logging activity to the account in this circumstance and not to the opportunity, they can review that and they can really quickly act on it to make sure that it gets one of those triggers is met and gets moved out of there. Update the booking state, reinstitute the stage. So that is um, one way that you can use flow automation on a um, trigger-based flow and a time-based flow to be able to manage your early stage pipeline, forecast a little bit better, as well as track meaningful activity and buying indicators. So I will stop sharing now. That was amazing, Annalisa. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A. Um, I did have a question that came in, Annalisa, um, which is, how do you know if there is a process of yours that you should even evaluate for Salesforce automation? Well, typically, in my experience, in, in what I've been working on, it is usually this problem solution, right? Typically, when things are going well um, and their adoption is great, and you have the visibility you need, the metrics are producing what you're anticipating, then um, it's it's not a call to action. But in a lot of cases, it will be, um, you know, we're having trouble getting insight into X, Y, Z, or we have low adoption. So we're seeing the users are not, they're bypassing this process. Um, that we've set up for them. We have a way to do something. And you know, in Salesforce, even if you set up a way to do something, you there are probably still three to four other ways to do it um, that either are impossible to turn off or, um, or maybe you don't want to turn them off because in certain circumstances, it is the right way to do something. So when you see low adoption, when you see that um, data isn't coming through as cleanly or in the way that you want, then it's really great to evaluate if you can basically guide the user through automation. In this case, we looked at restrict them from going into certain stages if they don't meet minimal criteria for that. Um, in other cases, it could be giving them warnings or guiding them to the correct location to be able to perform an action. And it could be basic automation, it doesn't have to be flow. It could be custom button creation on an object that basically guides them through a form. And if they don't go that route, a warning, like a flow warning to, to make sure that they understand that that is available for the circumstance that they need to apply it to. I love it. That's such a good answer. Thank you. That was really thoughtful and I think pretty comprehensive. So uh, one of the things that I think, um, you know, when people were, sending us messages ahead of this webinar that people were asking about is, um, can you help clarify a little bit the difference between a validation rule and automation? And would you ever use the two of them together? Yeah, possibly. Um, so what's nice about the flow is that it in, in this case, right, we can combine the two. Although I would say the flow errors are not as human readable as you can set the validation errors up to be. So that is something that, that we've experienced in the past, even by entering like a custom message to be displayed, just the way that the flow errors come across, it spooks individuals that are, <laughs> that are not accustomed to viewing them. Um, so it is possible that you might want to incorporate both, particularly if um, if there are cases that you can, you know, control things on a validation error basis, it might be easier than 
always going in and updating a flow and you know testing it in the sandbox launching it activating it in production so there are much more steps sometimes in the higher end automation that you can eliminate those number of steps with some of the lower end automation like validation rules I love that. I think that's a really good answer too. You know, when when we're thinking about how to help guide our users through Salesforce, because that's what we're all here for. You know, that's why this crowd joined us today. Um, we really want to make sure that our users get that help that they need. Now, are there amazing outcomes? Sure. You know, finance has cleaner pipelines. Sales management has a better idea of what are actually the right opportunities. Salespeople, um, you know, can get the access to the information they need about their conversion rates or the quality of their pipeline. And I think there's so many benefits to automation. And we've seen it change so much in the past, you know, five years. Right. I mean, Salesforce really has started to place, I think, uh, an exorbitant and necessary amount of, you know, impact on automation. Right. We've seen it change. You know, we've had process builder, we've had workflow rules, we've had flow, you know, there's been so much. And I think it feels intimidating. So a question that I have for you is if I'm a brand new, new person to Salesforce automation, how do I get over that sort of fear of yeah. introducing automation? I am not a flow expert by any means. I um, just have my basic Salesforce admin certification. So, and I actually did create this, this flow to auto progress stages and to do it, I just did a Google search and I found someone who had done auto progression of stages prior. And I looked at the guidance that they gave on the blog, on the developer sites, whatever it was, I found an example and it it didn't have anything to do with my example, but it was close enough that I could use that basis to be able to build out the specifics of what I was doing. Um, So my team and I, like we, we all say, you know, we don't, our, our main, our primary skill that helps us with Salesforce is that we're all researchers. So <laughs> we search for the Salesforce knowledge articles that can help guide us through because it is so nice that the information is open source and that will get you so far. And then with things like these customizations and these automations, we look for someone else who's done it before. Um, and kind of viewed how they have done it, seen what kind of tweaks um, that we need to make to be able to apply something similar to our problem to meet our solution. I love that. Thank you for sharing that because I think it is, it feels so heavy and hard to understand when you first come into it, but the possibilities are endless. And I know you're a Dreamforce expert. And one of the reasons why I think it's called Dreamforce is because you can start to dream about how to make make things better for your, for your entire team. So I love that. Um, We have a question. Do sales reps typically get an early warning before their opportunities are aged out and, or how has this automation process been helpful for better managing outside sales reps? Yeah. So we um, did start out low tech here with the auto age out process, right? So we just started with a report um, and uh, we have a data quality dashboard that gets reviewed every two weeks by one of our Salesforce admins. Uh, And basically the intent is to keep that dashboard down to zero. So none of the components should have any data. If any of the components have any data, they either need updated, reviewed and, and changed. And we started out low touch by especially when we first implement it, because as you can imagine, there were a lot of opportunities that met that trigger criteria when we first um, implemented it. But uh, in that circumstance, we just pulled a report off Salesforce, sent it to everybody that owned opportunities on that list and let them know we're instituting something new. We'd like you to take one of the following actions. If this opportunity is legitimate, update the bookings date to a date in the future update the um, follow-up steps, right? And we gave them maybe a week and a half to do that and then revisited the report. Anything that was still on there, we closed out. And then we've added two additional components to their homepage dashboard since. So we've added a list view, specifically shows them all their opportunities with bookings dates in the past. So that information is pushed to them so that they can manage it on an ongoing basis. And on their homepage dash, we added a component that shows them all of their opportunities that are eligible for age out. Since we're only running this once a month, 
um, they'll they'll have time to review those opportunities and go into them and make those updates to them. So now we don't um, we don't prepare them for the action. It just occurs on an ongoing basis, although we do give them tools to manage it themselves. And then they get that notification when it does happen through email. So if there are any that, again, like they've been logging activity against the account instead of the opportunity that wouldn't maybe have been caught, they get immediate notification that that's occurred and they can go in and, and um, basically ask one of our admin team to backstage it for them. That's amazing. Thank you. That was a really detailed response. And one of the things that I heard you saying um, was how throughout the whole entire process, you visited, you know, change management theory, because when you start with that sort of low touch and you work in the way that people are already working and continue to process it so they can see how it makes their life and their job better, they're more likely to adopt it. And so and that was a beautiful response that I think, you know, went around one, how do you handle it in the technology, but two, how do you help the people make the change? Because that's always the hard part. You know, people are running at hundred miles per hour. So that was great. Uh, thank you so much, Annalisa. This was a beautiful conversation. Hopefully everybody here today is inspired on how you can use Salesforce automation to help your team have better quality data, how you can have a better pipeline, how you can use Salesforce to make everybody's jobs a little bit better because we all know things are not going to get easier. They just keep getting faster, but Salesforce is fully equipped to help you with that. Uh, before we leave today, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors. We've got as our sponsors for the life for the life sciences dreamin whole entire series, Salesforce, Capstorm, Elements Cloud, Cloud Adoption Solutions, Steady State Media, Fido SEO. Next month we have a webinar you will not want to miss. We've got two experts in value stream mapping, which you've probably done, even if you don't call it that, they're going to be talking about how you can value stream map your go-to-market process to reduce the waste that you have in your go-to-market process and apply things like Annalisa just taught you about today, Salesforce automation. So we've got uh, JT, who's been a friend for a very long time. Actually, Annalisa, I know that we've uh, been students of JT's. He's taught us a lot about how to use value stream mapping and a Kaizen approach. And Ian from Element Cloud is going to be facilitating that webinar that is um, just in one month. Uh, after that, we've got a demo jam in March, a life sciences tech stars demo jam that is going to be really fun. Everybody's got three minutes to show their goods. So hopefully everybody is in attendance to that. Don't forget to visit lifesciencesdreamin.com because after our webinar series, we're heading into three live lunch and learns in Philly, Boston and Research Triangle Park. And then we've got our keynote conference in Fort Lauderdale in Orlando. We are currently looking for speakers and sponsors. So if you're interested in that, head yourself over to lifesciencesdreamin.com. Annalisa, thank you so much for this today. It was really marvelous. Absolutely. It was great uh, chatting with all of you today. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.